I'm Matt Kishard, and this is No Holds Barred. In today's session, we're going to talk about how to pick a lawyer. What's a trial lawyer? What's a litigator? What's the difference? How to pick a lawyer. It's an incredibly important question that many people get completely wrong. I want to say so often people call me up and say, oh boy, this happened in my case and that happened and I thought, oh, that's too bad. How, how did things go so wrong? And Well, my lawyer, and I said, oh, whoop, immediately step back. You have a lawyer? And they go, well, yeah. Well, then, uh, uh, as long as you have a lawyer, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not going to get involved because you have a lawyer and I don't want to be in a conflict situation and get in between you and your lawyer. No, 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 they say. I can't stand my lawyer and my lawyer is doing a terrible job. And I said, well, then you, you, you have two issues. Then discharge your lawyer and after you've done that, perhaps uh, I'll, I'll chat with you. I hear that too often. I hear that too often that people, well, you know, have this huge wrongful death case with my mother, but uh, I hired my brother-in-law's family lawyer out of Des Moines, Iowa, even though he's not licensed in California, he's been sending me texts about what I should do. That's not a good thing. That's not what you want. What you want to do is do a little research, talk to a lot of people, and when you hear the names of some lawyers that are suggested to you, look them up. Go to the State Bar website, see where they went to school, see how long they've been practicing. Go to their own websites. Now, I will say, there are so many websites out there, and most of them I read, they're the greatest lawyers in the whole world, no matter what. Uh, and many of whom I know, and they're not the greatest lawyers in the whole world. So don't. don't don't get involved in just looking at a website and saying these are important people. It's critical that you have some discussions. I was involved in a very big case in San Francisco some years ago, and I was a defense lawyer in a, in a very, very high value case, and I was speaking with the plaintiff's lawyer, and he was telling me how his client had interviewed a half a dozen of the very best plaintiff's firms in San Francisco, before deciding on him. Now, I know most people can't do that and uh, interview six or seven firms, but interview the lawyers. So I often see on the side of a, a, a building or on a website, somebody saying, uh, we're trial lawyers. Well, trial lawyers is a very special category of people, if in fact they are trial lawyers. And I say that having tried in excess of 100 jury trials to verdict. I have. I know very few lawyers who have tried 10 jury trials to verdict, but between my time as a deputy district attorney trying high-end cases and my time in the last 25 years or so as a civil lawyer trying high-end cases, I have that number of cases uh, to verdict. In addition, as a coroner's inquest hearing officer, I pick juries and I've picked them in somewhere between 125 and 150 cases and put the evidence on. That's important because what drives trials? The evidence code. How do you get something in? What's a piece of evidence? How can you get it in? What are potential objections? What are ways around those objections? And the only way you get that is through experience. I often laugh about, I took evidence in law school, enjoyed it very much, started out in the district attorney's office, and I didn't know the first thing about evidence because what we learned in law school really didn't apply. So when I first started my first year in the DA's office, at first I didn't object enough. Ooh, ooh, I, perhaps I should have objected and I didn't. And then later on, you get a little confident and you start objecting too much. And then after about a year or so, and lots of trials, you kind of get a sense of, all right, 
here's the evidence, here's how it comes in, here's some objections, is it important, is an objection important, is it going to not cause any issues, you learn. And the only way you learn to be a trial lawyer is by trying cases. So I want to go back to all these people that we hear about who say they're trial lawyers, and many of them aren't trial lawyers. So another little story, I went to a party one time when I was a deputy district attorney, and uh, one of the things that my boss looked at in looking at all the deputies on the team, uh, and we had a pretty large office, was how many trials you had, and that was kind of your badge of honor, how many trials you had. And so I was going to this party, and I met some fellow, there were a lot of lawyers there, and he was like, I said, well, what do you do for a living? He goes, well, uh, I'm, I'm a litigator. And I go, oh, how many trials have you had? Um, being unaware uh, of the difference between a litigator and a trial lawyer. And he goes, well, well, well I've never had a trial. I've, I'm, I've never had a trial, actually. I'm, I'm a litigator. I was thinking, okay, so what the heck is a litigator? Well, it's a person who works up a case prior to trial. And apparently in his experience, these cases settled before trial or maybe he had a more senior partner that took him to trial. I, I didn't know. I wrote an article some years ago in the Contra Costa magazine about kind of that same thing. Um, what's the difference between a litigator and a trial lawyer? Well, a trial lawyer has hopefully trial experience, knows how to try a case, knows the evidence code, knows objections properly. Whereas a litigator is gathering discovery, gathering evidence. And now we're talking about the civil side here, I want to appreciate. Um, but I, I do want to say that the criminal side, it's the same 12 people. It, it's, it's the evidence code. It's the same evidence code. So whether somebody came up through the criminal system or came up through the civil system, if they're trial lawyers, they're trial lawyers. Uh, many people are simply litigators. Why is it important? Because in my experience, many times I would walk into a settlement conference, somebody would bring me in, retain me just to, to try the case, and I'd walk into a settlement conference, know the judge, know the mediator, know the settlement judge, however it worked, and people go, ooh, there's, there's Matt Gishard. And he tries a lot of cases, and he knows how to try a case. And that was, uh, that was very good because in most of those cases, those cases settled. Now, I'm not saying that to brag. I'm saying that to alert those of you who are lawyers, trial lawyers, litigators, or litigants who are looking for lawyers. If you believe your case is going to go to trial, hire somebody who has that experience of having gone to trial. And how do you find that out? Well, there are a number of ways. There are some very high-end organizations, I want to say, ABODA and American Board of Trial Advocates, some other organizations where in order to just get in, you have to have tried a number of cases. So just being in those organizations means those are trial lawyers. Um, never mind super lawyers or any of those other things because those are, those are the, you can try no cases ever and, and, and be in one of those. Now, I don't want to demean them. In many cases, there are uh, uh, very good people who are super lawyers. I have a super lawyers thing that I get every year. It's all wonderful. I stick it on the wall. Um, but it has nothing to do with my trial practice. So interview them. F research about them. Find out if there are any other, just like you had somebody paint your house and you wanted to get, find out from Mrs. McGillicuddy, who, who they said they painted her house. Find out from her, did they do a good job? Do the same with your lawyers, find out. You do not want to be caught in a situation where you've retained somebody because some friend told you they were a good lawyer, and at the end of the day, find out that actually they're scared to death of trials, they've never tried a case before, and um, they don't want to go to trial. And that is something that, uh, that, that, you don't want to be caught in that if you're a litigant. I used to say we knew in the district attorney's office who on the criminal defense side who were the lawyers that went to trial, and who are the ones that did not go to trial. And to this day, people know, okay, we can 
be a little more hard nosed to that person because they don't go to trial. Um, so both criminal and civil, that's important. And I say, in my training, when a civil case comes in, whether it's on the plaintiff side or on the defense side, I analyze the case from the standpoint of how is this going to play to a jury? And that's, there are equities and sometimes you think this is going to play very well to a jury or not. And then think, let's go back. I talked about it way back in one of our No Holds Barred when we were talking about cases in the personal injury uh, realm and talking about there are cases need to be analyzed first on liability and then on damages. So that's the idea. Is somebody at fault? Can you prove liability? And if you can prove liability, what are the damages? And in some cases, we have cases where huge damages, but very difficult to prove liability. Or easy to prove liability, but really not much in the way of damages. And th that analysis has to take place at the very start. When people come to our firm, I go over our legal services agreement, the contract that we have that's required by law. I go over it with the clients and then I tell them to take it home. I don't want them to sign it in front of me or right there. I want them to read it, think about it, and contact me before they sign it. Now, many lawyers no, stick it in front of somebody because they want to sign up that client. We don't do that. I want the client to be comfortable. I want them to understand it and I want them to ask me any questions. And that's part of choosing a good lawyer. I was watching television the other day and I was interested in seeing a lawyer advertisement which a fellow standing up in a suit saying what great lawyers they were and they had a whole room full of people on the phone behind him and saying, call in and we will tell you what your case is worth. I've been doing this for quite some time and handled lots and lots of cases on the civil side, both as plaintiff's attorney and defense attorney. And I'll tell you what, if somebody calls me up and talks for a couple of days, I can't tell them what their case is worth. I don't know what the liability issues are. I don't know what the damages issues are. I don't know if there's any insurance coverage. There are a number of questions that can't be known on a telephone call to somebody on the phone at a table and we'll tell you what your case is worth. It's just absolute nonsense. And I certainly don't mean to demean those people who uh, bring in a lot of cases by that kind of advertising. Come to us, we'll get you more. Or somebody says, you know, the insurance company offered me 200,000, but my lawyers got me 450,000. And that can only happen if their legs were cut off and the insurance company didn't know it because that difference is so huge. Now, somebody may have a brain injury that initially they didn't know about and eventually it, but rarely, rarely is somebody going to get an offer of 200,000 or 2,000, excuse me, and get 400,000, 500,000, a million. Rarely, you can look at a case and kind of get a sense, but you need to know what is the coverage? What is insurance? What is it? Also, when you hire an attorney, find out who else works at their firm. Do they have other people there or are they just a solo? Solos are good. They certainly can be good. I know a lot of solos who do excellent work, but do they have the staff to support? Can they write the motions? Can they do the things that need to be done to properly handle your case, particularly in the personal injury realm? And I will tell you, there are differences uh, between attorneys and the approach. And sometimes attorneys will turn down a case thinking that it doesn't have the kind of value that they would like. A friend of mine recently talked about a dog bite case and we, I was offended a little bit because he's a good friend and we do dog bite cases a great deal and we've got some very good recoveries and he was telling me how he referred it to a friend who now it didn't have enough value and then another lawyer got it and got about 150,000. So wait a minute. So I said to him, well, let's talk about that in the future their dog bite cases, please send them to me. Another case that's interesting is a very good firm that I know recommended to the clients that take the $15,000 statutory limit that was available for the registered owner of a vehicle. And I don't know if you recall, 
we talked a couple of episodes back about um, liability for a registered owner who let somebody else drive the car, permissive use, and the liability, unless there's negligent entrustment, is limited to 15000 So in that particular case, it was a horrific accident and significant injuries, uh, but a very good lawyer had recommended, well, I don't sue anything, and um, I recommend you take the 15000 They came to our firm. Uh, we looked at it from a little different perspective and appreciated that there were some issues with the vehicle and the design of the vehicle, how the vehicle had been modified, and we um, actually, at the end of the day, uh, recovered a million and a half dollars for that, that client, um, who was forever grateful and had significant injuries. So um, different lawyers look at things different ways, and the best thing to do is talk to several lawyers before deciding on one, or if somebody is a little pushy, here, here, hire me, hire me, hire me. Just interview them, make sure that they have uh, the trial work, the trial background in order to go to trial. And I'm gonna repeat, you want somebody who has that ability, even if the case does not proceed to trial. You wanna know that if you, you need to get into the OK Corral, that your lawyer, is armed and ready to go. And that's critically important uh, in our world, critically important. There are lots and lots of lawyers out there, and I don't think anyone's gonna be offended if you go and interview a few, ask around a little bit, um, do your own due diligence, and to find out what their background, training, and experience is uh, before pulling the trigger. And, and one of the concerns that I have is we often, and I'm going to repeat myself, we often get cases where somebody has been represented already. And I'm sometimes uh, chagrined, sometimes appalled at the, the work uh, that was maybe not done in the case or how the work was done. Um, and they didn't get good representation. And I often say in some cases we, we don't take the cases. It's like being given a cold have eaten hamburger and said hey, this is your dinner well no thanks no thanks in some cases we do get in but understand as lawyers when you take a case that somebody else has handled for a period of time particularly in the pi issue there's a an idea of quantum merit how much time did they put in and they can lean the case so the idea is that <clears throat> there may be a big lean from the lawyer from before He's calculated the number of hours that he's put in and calculated he or she, this is how much time and effort I put in and I'm going to put a lien into this case for this amount and maybe hire a couple of experts. Um, so what we would have to do when we resolve the case, either at trial or mediation, is uh, get a recovery sufficient to pay off whatever medical liens, but also the lawyer's lien and his expert's liens and all that before we get a penny. So you could see why it can be a real mess, and you don't want to find yourselves in that. I mentioned it before, and in, in, uh, again, I want to tell people how important it is to have, I want to say, a good reputation with judges, with mediators, and with other counsel. And I like to say I certainly do, and it's nice uh, to go into court and be recognized as doing a good job. Uh, also, to be recognized as having a great deal of trial experience. And I oftentimes use that term that many times I've been hired by other lawyers um, to be kind of a hired gun. To come in in settlement conference or at mediation or even come in at the end to try the case. And based on my reputation uh, and my experience, um, that has a, a great deal of sway. And I can recall several very good arbitrators in San Francisco that would, excuse me, mediators in San Francisco that would often say, whoa, to the other side, you know, Mr. Guichard has tried a lot of cases. He's highly respected in many, many counties in the state of California, both state and federal courts. He's tried cases and he knows how to try a case. And you want to be very careful proceeding with Mr. Guichard on the other side. And 
I'm actually proud of that. I'm saying that not to brag, although it's a little bit of bragging, but I'm saying that to say that is a very important attribute to have in a lawyer. So whether people hire me at the very start or lawyers hire me uh, to come in and, and assist them in resolving a case or actually trying a case, I will say I get calls regularly from lawyer friends of mine saying, let me run something by you. Let me, what about, what do you think about this? What do you think I should do? And I'm very happy to get those calls and very happy uh, to assist those friends of mine and give them um, advice based on the years of experience uh, that I've had. So that's, uh, that's it on choosing a lawyer. It's very important that you listen to this, watch it again if you need, be careful who you hire, and do your due diligence. So if you like this episode of No Holds Barred, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. It helps with our YouTube algorithms. And again, if you have any questions or even comments about this episode, write them below. I always read them. I'm always interested, and in many cases, I mention them and answer those questions in a future No Holds Barred.